Okay, so in this video, I'm going to show you how to create this project, which could be, for example, something like a charging indicator or something like that. You can see there are some particles floating around the circle on the OLED display displaying some kind of value. And I'm using this tiny board, which is called Seed Shao. And I believe that the Shao means small in Chinese, but at the same time, it probably has 10 other different meanings in Chinese as well. And I'm using this together with this slightly bigger, but still small expansion board. And those both come from the Seed Studio, which is a sponsor of today's video. So thank you, Seed Studio. Also stick to the end of the video to see how this chip performs compared to the Arduino Uno and Arduino Mega, and I think you will be surprised, at least I was. You can also use other displays, for example this fancy transparent OLED display which uses the very same driving chip and has the very same resolution, so it's just a matter of connecting it to the I2C interface of the Xiao board. Someone asked me if you can see the image from the other side of the display, and the answer is yes. It's just slightly dimmed and not shining as much. Anyway, let's get started. We will start by looking at the documentation and it's worth noting that there are multiple versions of the Xiao board and there is this table down here which shows the comparison. So I'm using this one, the Seed Studio Xiao with the chip NRF52840. There is a second board which uses the same chip but it has more sensors which is the Sense board and there is also the board which uses the RP2040 which is Raspberry Pi chip. The great thing is that all those boards support Arduino, MicroPython as well as CircuitPython for programming and I will be using Arduino today just because I like it the most. If you scroll down there is a section called Getting Started which shows the individual steps so you will connect the board by using the USB-C cable to your PC, download the Arduino ID if you don't have it already and then you have to install the initial board so I will copy this URL into my clipboard, jump to Arduino IDE, select file preferences, click here to open the initial board manage URLs and paste it in here. You can see I already have it in here so this is the one but if you don't have it you have to paste it and then click the OK button, OK button one more time, then go to tools, board and select board manager, type in seat NRF52, press the enter key and install this one so seat NRF52 board so it will click install I have removed because I already have this installed, click the close button, select tools, board and make sure you select the seat NRF52 board, either the sense or the normal one which is the one that I have. So I'll click this one and then the next thing of course once I have those boards connected is select the right port, it's nicely labeled so I can see that this is, it's this one but of course for your case it will be a different com port. Once we have everything set up it's time to test the simplest possible sketch and that is blinking the onboard LED so I will select file, examples, basics and that will be the blink one. I don't have to change anything, I will just press the upload button. And if everything goes smooth, you should see a blinking onboard LED on the board itself like this. If you have problems uploading the sketch, try pressing the reset button once or twice. There is this small, almost invisible reset button on the board itself, or if you are using the expansion board, there is a slightly bigger reset button in here. So once we know that the microcontroller is working, it's time to test the expansion board. And again, I will open the documentation, and if you scroll down, there is a nice little image which shows all the things that are included on this board, but I'm mostly interested on in the OLED display. So I will scroll down even a little bit more to find the OLED display section, and there is a small example on how to use it. So we have to place the microcontroller on the expansion board, then install the UAD G2 library to the Arduino IDE, and then copy this sample piece of code. So let's do that. Back in Arduino IDE, I will select Tools, Manage Libraries, and here I will search for UAD G2 library. Scroll down to find the right one, which is this one, and make sure it's installed. I already have this installed, so I have this install button disabled. Click the close and paste the sample code from the Seed Studio website. Then click the upload button and see what happens. It takes some time, so I've made the playback a little bit faster. And you can see it shows an error message, couldn't find a board on the selected port, so I'll try to press the reset button and do this one more time and hopefully it will work now. And actually I had to press the reset button two times, but it fixed the problem. So now we should see a message displayed on the OLED display saying hello world. And I think it's a great progress because in just a few minutes we were able to get the board up and running and use it together with the OLED display. Now let's talk about the UAD G2 library and how it works. There are three different modes that could be used together with the library. There is a page mode which is the same as the original UAD G library. There is a text mode which is the one that we are using right now. And in this mode the display is split into 8x8 pixel pieces and you can only print the text. And then there is the third mode which is a full screen buffer mode which is the one used for growing graphics and that's the one which we will be using today. Let's open some example from the UADG2 library using the full screen buffer. So I will open file, examples, UADG2 library, select the full buffer and for example this UADG2 logo. Now the important part is set to the correct initialization for the display and you can see we have quite a lot of displays to choose from. So if I open the previous example which was working, you can see that we have OLED display that is using the SSD1306 chip in the size of 120 by 64 pixels and we are using the hardware I2C connection without the reset pin. So let's see if we can find something similar in this example. So we are looking for SSD1306 in the 120 by 64 pixel resolution using the hardware i square c without the reset pin and I think that this one looks like the one we are looking for. So I will uncomment this one and try to upload it on the board. Again, I will speed up the section a little bit. 
So once this is up and running, we should see the UHG2 logo displayed on the OLED screen. And it might look something like this. Nothing is moving or changing, but it's a great first step for our own design. And I know that you know what we are trying to achieve because you've already seen the final product. But when I was thinking about which project to show, I was thinking, well, this microcontroller should be faster than the Arduino Uno. So what about showing some kind of particles, for example? So I've searched for pixel particle effects and I found this pixel effects designer application, which is kind of cool and shows a lot of nice examples. But unfortunately, all of those are using colors and I wasn't quite sure of how nicely they will look when converted to grayscale or actually black and white. But this one I kind of like, so I tried to recreate this one except in the opposite direction of the animation, so going from inside to outside. Anyway, back to our code. So for the next part, I will be using Walkway, which is a free online Arduino emulator. And I will scroll down and create a new project using the Arduino Uno. I, of course, want to add a new display. So I'll click this plus button and type in SSD 1306 OLED display, which I will connect to the I2C interface. A4 is SDA, so SDA is A4 and A5 is SCL. Then the 5 volt for the VCC and the ground for the ground. I want to install the UHG2 library, so I'll jump to library manager and click this plus button and type in UHG2 and install this library. Then go back to sketch and in here I will copy the UHG2 logo example and press the run button. And hopefully I should see the logo displayed on the display. You can see that there is quite a lot of code which we don't really need, so I will get rid of most of those. And this is probably the minimum required code to get the UHG2 library up and running. We are not drawing anything at this point, so if I restart the simulation there will be nothing on the display displayed, but we can start adding our elements. Just to summarize the code, in the setup function we call the UHG2 begin to initialize the UHG2 drawing, and then in the loop we first the clear buffer, then we will draw something, and then we will send the buffer to the display. Now let's start by something simple, edit this for example by drawing the filled circle, which is called draw disk. So if I open the documentation, I'll just copy this piece into our code, paste it in here, of course, copy the UHG2 prefix, and we want to set the X position, the Y position, and the radius. This is optional, so we can get rid of this one. So let's just say that it will be in the middle of the screen, so 64 pixels for X, 32 pixels for Y, and the radius might be, for example, 10. Let's restart the simulation, and hopefully we'll see the circle, which is exactly the case. So you can see now we have a nice looking circle in the middle of the screen. Let's try to turn that into a floating particle, and for that we need a few more variables. So we will need the position of the particle, the X and Y position. We also need some kind of velocity for the X and Y, so speed X and speed Y. And let's just say we also need some kind of size. In the setup function, let's initialize those values. So it will start in the middle of the screen, so the X will be 64 and the Y will be 32 for the middle of the screen. For the size, let's say this could be, for example, 8 in diameter. And let's add some random values for the X and Y speed. And the equation I used was a random between minus 5 and 6. The reason for using different numbers is because the minus 5 is included in the random function, but the 6 is actually not, so it will go from minus 5 to 5. And what I did is I've multiplied this by 3, but at the same time divided by 10. And there's just a trial and error, and I've used the separate very same equation for the y as well. So inside the loop, we want to update those values. We want to change the x and y position by adding the speed. So particle x equals particle x plus speed x. And we want to do the very same thing for the y position. So particle y equals particle y plus speed y. And we want to draw the circle on the position particle x and particle y. And of course, the radius will be particle size. If I restart the simulation, we should see the circle going to some direction and then disappearing completely because we are not testing if it goes outside of the screen. So let's just do that. I will create a new if statement and test if the X and Y position is outside of the display. So I will say that if the particle X is bigger than 128 or if the particle X is smaller than 0 or if the particle Y is bigger than 64 or smaller than 0. In that case, we want to reset the values. So I'll just copy it from the beginning, from the setup function without changing anything. And let's restart the simulation. So now when the circle goes outside of the screen, it will reappear in the middle of a different direction and a different speed. Also, as the particle goes further away from the center or closer to the edge, let's just make this level smaller. So I will say that the particle size equals particle size times some coefficient. And I found out that 0.95 works just fine. I want to also update my if statement and I will add one more check, which where I will say that if the particle size is smaller than some value, for example, 0.5, I will also create this particle one more time. So let's rerun the simulation and hopefully when the circle goes away from the center, it will get smaller to the point that it will disappear and then reappear again back in the middle of the screen, which is exactly the case. So you can see it starts big, but it gets smaller. 
and you can play with the value. If you want the particle to stay bigger for a longer time, you can just use a value closer to one. Speaking of number one, it will be nice to have more than one particle flying around in the screen. For that, we will define a new constant that will be the number of particles, and let's just call this num particles and set it for example to 20 for now and we want to change all our variables to be arrays so I'll just put in the array with the size of number of particles and then obviously we need to change all the setting the particles and drawing the particles to be inside the loop so I will say that for integer i equals 0 while the i is smaller than num number of particles I will increase the i and change the individual variables to be referencing the element y in the array and I will copy this for loop into our main loop as well. So inside here, I will paste the very same loop. So I will go over all the particles. Again, I need to add this y element. So particle x, y, and pretty much all the other variables which are now arrays should be treated as arrays. And you can see it's just a matter of adding square brackets with the index of y. And hopefully that should be it, but we will find out soon once I restart the simulation and we will see if we see 20 different particles flying around. And that seems to be the case, so we have a nice looking particle effect coming from the central to the edge of the screen, changing size and changing the direction and speed. And it looks even better running on the display, also just a little bit faster compared to the emulator. Let's draw this big circle in the middle and show some kind of value. The big circle will be super simple. We will just copy this uhg to draw this function and we'll paste it below our loop. And for the x and y position, we will actually use the center of the screen, which is 64 and 32. And the radius might be, for example, 20. Restart the simulation and now we have a big circle in the middle. For drawing the text, we need to set the color to black using the set draw color function. And setting it to zero will turn the color to black. And of course, we need to set it to white before drawing the individual particles. So maybe here I will set it to white. And as for actual text, I will use the draw string function. And that one expects the x and y position. So for example, 40, 6, and 40. We'll change later on. And let's set the string to 50% and see how it looks like. And we don't see anything. And I believe it's because we haven't set the font. Thankfully, there are quite so many fonts available for the UHG2 library. And I kind of like this one, which is called Cargen92. So I'll make sure to set it to the right name in my initialization. So in the setup function, I will change the font by calling setFont from the UHG library. Let's restart the simulation. And hopefully now we will see the string. So really, the only thing left to do is to make sure that the string is actually dynamic and it's somehow changing. For that, let's create a new variable and call it charge value. And while we are creating new variables, let's also create a new C style string, which we will simply call charge value buffer with the size of, for example, 10, that should be more than enough. And we will use this buffer later on to convert this integer value into the C style character string and display it on the display. But before we do so, inside the loop function, I will just increase the charge value. So I will say the charge value is the charge value plus one. And of course, if the charge value is bigger than 100, I will set it back to zero. Now for converting this charge value into the C style string, we will use the sprintf function and that one expects the buffer first. So we'll copy the buffer name in here and then we're going to format the string using some attributes and we'll type in percentage %d for the integer, which we'll of course insert, which will be the charge value. But we want to also include the percentage sign. And to do that, we have to actually type in two percentage signs like this. So now we will connect this integer, which is the charge value, together with the percentage sign. So now instead of printing 50%, we can actually print charge value buffer instead. Restart our simulation, make sure that we are not missing any semicolons. And you see the value rapidly changing from zero up to 100%. Let's make the big circle slightly bigger. So for example, instead of 20 pixel in radius, I will set it to 24. And let's just try to draw the string center aligned. For this, we need to know the string width and we can get it by using the get string width function. So I will create a new variable called string width and call the u8g2 function, which is called get string width. It requires only one parameter and it is our buffer. So I'll copy the buffer in there. And now we know how the string is wide before even drawing it. So we can use it to our advantage and draw it in the center of the screen, which is 64 minus the string width divided by two. Now, if I restart the simulation, hopefully the small numbers will be also center aligned as well as the big numbers. So it looks a little bit better now. So you can see now it jumps to numbers below 10. It's also center aligned, looks, looks much better. And it looks even better running on the actual OLED display. Same as the last time, you can see it runs much faster on this microcontroller compared to the emulator inside the browser. The last touch would be drawing a logo in the corner of the screen, and the UHG2 library requires the images to be in the XBM format and then calling the draw XBM function. But thankfully, I found this online XBM editor, which is kind of cool. You can create simple images with this editor, so I'll just change the size of the canvas to be 16 by 4 pixels, clear the pixels, and then try to draw my logo. By the way, if this is quite small, you can of course use Ctrl and Scroll wheel to zoom the page a little bit more, and then we have bigger pixels to work with. 
Okay, so something like this should work for me. So I'll copy this array into our code somewhere around here. And then we will use this draw XBM function from the UIG2 library. So I'll just copy this one, paste it down here and fill in the right values. Also keep in mind that we have to first change the color to be white because we've already changed it to black for our text. So I'll change it back to white. So value of one. Then we want to insert the X position, which will be 128 minus the width of this image, which is 16. The Y position will be the height of the screen, which is 64 minus the height of the image, which is four. The width of the image is 16 and the height of the image is four. And our bitmap is named with some random name, which is uh, called image bits. So so I'll rename this to bitmap peer logo and use the very same name in our drawing function, which is this parameter. Let's just add the semicolon and of course the u8g2 prefix to the function and restart the simulation to see how it looks like. And you can see that indeed we have a small logo in the corner of the display being displayed. Now an important detail about drawing the images. So if you define image like this, it will be initially in the flash memory, but once you start a sketch, it will be copied into RAM. The thing is, RAM is usually smaller and we don't have to put stuff into RAM that is not changing and we will definitely not change the content of this image. So what we can do is we can tell the application to not copy this variable into the RAM memory and keep it in the flash all the time. And we do it by adding this program memory word in here. And we also have to make this a constant, so constant unsigned character variable. But the thing is, if you define an image like this, you have to use a different function to draw the image. So instead of drawing draw XBM, we will say draw XBM P and the P stands for the program memory. So if I open the UADG2 documentation, you can see here that the XBM P version of this procedure expects a bitmap to be in the program memory. If I restart the simulation, it will look absolutely the same, except now the image is not being copied into RAM memory, it stays in the flash memory all the time. So we are saving RAM this way. Okay, so I've made a few more changes. So there is this FPS indicator, which shows how fast this is being animated. The circle in the middle is changing the size. So there is this equation, which calculates the sine function of the time value, and it's just making the circle bigger and smaller. And I'm also placing the particles not right in the center, but with some kind of spread around, so it's more dynamic. However, what you might notice as well is there is some kind of blinking around the text and it's just you know not looking nice and it might be hard to tell from the walkway emulator what's going on but it will be immediately clear when you switch to the Arduino IDE. So here I have the very same code and if I switch the board to be the Arduino Uno and compile the code you will see what's going on. And that's this one, we are using 96% of the RAM memory, which might be a problem and it seems to be the problem why we see the blinking. And the main reason for using so much memory is of course using the UADG2 library in the full screen mode, which means that we need a buffer in the size of 128 by 64 pixels, which means that we, we are already using all half of the memory just for the buffer itself. So as a quick fix, I've changed the particle speed from floats to integer and then inside the calculations, I'm just dividing by 10 instead of having the floating point value for the speed. And that seems to fix the blinking issue. And here is the final project running on the seat shower board. You can see it runs at 27 or 28 FPS, which is quite a reasonable speed. So let's see how it compares to the other microcontrollers, namely Arduino Uno and Arduino Mega. So here is the Arduino Uno board. It doesn't look like the Arduino Uno board, but that's the seat studio version of Arduino Uno board. And what I like about it is this little switch, which you can use to switch between 3.3 volt or 5 volt logic, which is kind of convenient. So I will place this shield with two OLED displays and upload the sketch. And you can see that the FPS number is around 15, so like the half the speed of the seat shower board. And it's kind of matching the speed that we were seeing in the walkway online emulator. For Arduino Mega, it's kind of surprising to see that the FPS is only around 14 FPS, so it's even lower than the Arduino Uno. I was actually thinking it would be a little bit faster. I mean, the microcontroller frequency is the same, it's 16 MHz, but the Arduino Mega is 32 bit and the Arduino Uno is only 8 bit. Please let me know in the comments if you think you know why it's this happening, why the Arduino Mega is actually slower than the Arduino Uno. And that's it for today's video. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Thanks and bye.